Today on In Touch, Dr. Charles Stanley explains how the salvation of believers was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. We were not purchased with silver and gold, but listen, he said, with the precious blood of Jesus. Well, how did that work? Jesus, watch this carefully. Jesus Christ came into the world for the purpose of laying down his life as, listen, as a substitute. That's the key word, as a substitute for you and me so that you and I would not have to die in our sin, so that you and I would not have to live in bondage and enslavement to sin. He paid our price when he went to the cross and shed his blood. Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. You fight your battles on your knees. We reap what we sow, more than we sow, and later than we sow. Stand tallest and strongest on our knees. If necessary, God will move heaven and earth to show us His will. The most hated, feared word in the Bible by Satan is what I want to talk about this morning in this message. And if you look around and listen carefully, you won't find people talking about this very often. In fact, when you bring it up, they may think, well, that's a little obnoxious and I don't want to talk about that. And it's very evident in contemporary worship services that almost never do you hear them singing about this. I don't know why, except that somehow we're living in an age when this uh, seems to be considered antiquated, uh, outdated, uh, uninteresting, when according to the Scripture, it must be very important because it's mentioned 427 times, 84 times in the New Testament, and you find it from the first book of the Bible all the way through the last one. Anything that's mentioned that many times is very important, and especially this. And what I want to talk about is the precious blood of Jesus. And uh, when you think about that, somebody says, well, why do they call it so precious? That's what I want to talk about. And if you listen carefully, here's what you'll realize. That everything about your relationship to God is wrapped up in the blood of Jesus Christ. This isn't something that's just some category in the Old Testament. All the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament. So I want you to turn, if you will, to 1 Peter and the first chapter. And I want us to read beginning in verse 17, a few verses here. And uh, on the mag screens, the scriptures will be here for all of these points. But I want you to listen carefully to what he says in the 17th verse. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ." For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Now, you'll notice, for example, he says, as he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Uh, Jesus did not come as an accident. Jesus came as a part of the awesome plan of God to redeem mankind. And if you'll think about it for a moment uh, and think about the whole idea of blood, uh, the question comes, well, why is that so important? Well, um, let me go back to Leviticus chapter uh, 17 for a moment. And I want you to notice a verse here uh, in this 17th chapter and um, the 11th verse. Uh, God made it very, very clear why the blood is so very important. And so here's what he says in verse 11 of Leviticus 17. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Now, do you know what your body is without blood? It's a corpse. That's what it is. It has no life in it. And when you take this book, the Bible, and you take the blood out of it, do you know what this is? This is a book of history and literature and events. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that began back in the very beginning of time 
all the way through to the end of time. For example, where did it all start? It all started in the Garden of Eden. And you'll recall when Adam and Eve sinned against God and God came to meet them and they confessed what they had done. And the Scripture says that after God had told them what was going to happen as a result of their sin, He placed skins upon them, which meant it was an animal, which meant the animal had to die and the blood had to be shed. From the very beginning of events in the Word of God, blood was an important thing. Because you see, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. And when you go through the Scriptures, and I want to take you on a little journey today, that you'll begin to understand that everything you have is wrapped up, wrapped in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting that there's so little said about it. We talk about the cross, but not about the blood. So look what happened. Not only did he deal with Adam and Eve on the basis of shedding blood and covering their naked bodies, but when you come to the Exodus and the people of God, 400 years in bondage, and now God's bringing them out. And after all these plagues that God sent upon uh, the Egyptians, the last one, the warning was the death angel is coming through Egypt that night. And if you are in a house where there is blood on the lintel and on the doorpost, both doorposts, if you're in the house, you are safe. But if the blood is not on the doorpost and the lintel of your house, the firstborn in there will die. Can you imagine what happened throughout that land when those people who did not believe that laughed at the whole idea and there was death everywhere? Well, you could just go all the way through the Old Testament. And oftentimes people say, well, why do you read that Old Testament stuff about all those sacrifices and all those things? Because, watch this, all of that was a foreshadowing of what was to come. Because those things, as the Bible says, did not take away sin. But it was a foreshadowing of an ultimate sacrifice that would take away all of man's sin. And so what did God do? For two reasons. Number one, in order to teach the people of His day and for us to learn the fact that God is a holy God. The Bible says that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all, no sin. And so he had to teach them that he was a holy God and that sin brought terrible consequences. And the result of it would be death. And you and I read in the Scriptures, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And people listen to that and say, oh, you know what, that's some biblical stuff. My friend, it isn't just biblical stuff. It is the truth. If you will look around you, all you have to do is look around you. What are the consequences of sin today in people's lives? It is the destruction of the human body through all kinds of diseases. It is murder. It is loss. It is need. You, you can just go right through what happens. Broken homes, broken marriages, all the things that the Bible warns us about. Sin is a destroyer. And so what was God saying to them and to us? God is holy. Sin will be punished. And in order for sin to be dealt with, it takes life, the shedding of blood to do it. And so all that whole sacrificial system had one message in mind, primarily. God is holy. God judges sin. And in order for sin to be judged, that means there will be death. There will be the shedding of blood. So let's think about it for a moment. Who is this? That is, when we think about the fact that Jesus' blood is precious, and we ask the question, well, why is it so precious? It's precious, first of all, because of who He is. Who is this Jesus? Now, think about this. Jesus wasn't just a man born in Bethlehem. He was the Son of God, and He was born of a virgin. And you will hear people say, and many pastors will say, well, the virgin birth is not all that important. We don't, we don't have to deal with that. Oh, yes, we do. And here's the reason why. Jesus came to be the eternal sacrifice for man's sin. The Scripture says that all those sacrifices in the Old Testament all the way up to the, very, to the New Testament were only a foreshadowing. It was like a big hint, a big picture, a, 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 a hope of something that was coming, that finally the ultimate Lamb of God would come. 
That Lamb of God is the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, not of an earthly father, so that His birth is not a normal birth. He was conceived by the, by the Holy Spirit, which meant there was no sin transferred to Him. The sinless Son of God, His blood is divine for the simple reason God sent Him on a mission, and He sent Him to be that perfect, spotless Lamb of God. And in those sacrifices, when they sacrificed an animal, it was very, very important that that animal was spotless, absolutely perfect, examined thoroughly by the priest, or they would never accept the sacrifice. So who is this? This is the Son of God. This is God clothed in human flesh who came to live among us to demonstrate what a life of godliness is all about, to reveal to us the Father, but primarily He came as the Lamb of God to lay down His life for all mankind. And whoever you may be, if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're missing what life's all about. Every single person needs the blood of Jesus Christ in their life, or they are eternally lost. And all you have to do is to read this book. You see, one of the problems today is that people have decided they don't believe this, that it's antiquated, that uh, you can do without this. Do you know why this nation is in the terrible condition it is in? Because a number of years ago, we decided to remove ourselves from this book, take it out of our society, and we do our own thing. You see what our own thing has gotten us? And it's getting worse and worse and worse, and it will get worse until the people in this country wake up and realize we better get back to the Word of God when we had plenty, when we were safe. <laughs> when things were totally different than they are today. It is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you in a few moments how very precious the Word of God is, how precious especially is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We said it's precious because of whose blood it is, sinless, perfect, atoning, sacrificial blood. Why He came to lay down His life, He said, I came to give my life a ransom for many. Now, how does this all relate to our relationship to Him? Because you see, apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, you can't have a relationship with Him. You say, well, I certainly can. I'm a church member, and uh, I, don't, I don't go for all that stuff, but uh, I can talk to God, and I can do this, and I'm sure He hears my prayers. No, He doesn't. You eliminate the blood. What I want you to see, to walk away from this message understanding, the blood of Jesus Christ is absolutely essential to our relationship to Him and to every aspect of it. And I want to show you it in the Scripture. I want to put the Scriptures on the Mac screen so you can read them for yourself. Here's what He says. So let's begin with the first one of those, and that is redemption. So what is it? Back to 1 Peter for a moment, and look, if you will, in this passage what He says, and you're going to find the blood of Jesus Christ in all of this. He says in verse uh, 18, knowing that you were not redeemed. Now, what does redeemed mean? It means to buy something back. In the days in which uh, Paul wrote and in the days in which Jesus lived, there were approximately 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. So when they talked about slavery and they talked about bondage, they knew what they were talking about. And so here's what he says, that you and I were not purchased uh, with things like silver and gold. That is, our, our eternal life didn't come as a result of something we did. Watch that one. Something we did, something we gave, something we bought, something we own, whatever. He says, but, watch this, but with, the, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So, what I want you to see here is that your redemption, you say, well, what do you mean redemption? I'm simply meaning this, that when Jesus Christ came, He went to the cross for the primary purpose, watch this carefully, of purchasing you, purchasing you from a life of slavery. Every single person apart from Jesus Christ is living in slavery to sin, all kinds of sin. Now, you can show me some very sophisticated people who are very moral and who are this, that, and the other, and so forth, but what we forget is what is the condition, what's the condition of their heart? That is, what's their nature? We were all born into a sinful nature. And apart from the grace of God, we're lost. 
So he says, we were not purchased with silver and gold, but listen, he said, with the precious blood of Jesus. Well, how did that work? Jesus, Christ, watch this carefully. Jesus Christ came into the world for the purpose of laying down his life as, listen, as a substitute. That's the key word, as a substitute for you and me so that you and I would not have to die in our sin, so that you and I would not have to live in bondage and enslavement to sin. He paid our price when he went to the cross and shed his blood. God the Father accepted this Lamb of God as a vicarious and substitute for all of us, so that now when you and I ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and to save us and receive Him as our Savior, what happens? We are liberated. We are freed from the bondage of sin, and the power of God inhabits our life. Redemption, that's what it's all about. It's the fact that He bought us out. Now, you say, well, now, did Jesus pay off the devil? No. Watch this carefully. He didn't pay off the devil. He satisfied the righteous law of God, which says the soul that's in it, that shall die. All of us have sinned. What do we have coming? What do we have coming our way? Nothing but death and separation from God. But now that he paid our sin debt in full on the cross, we can be free to be the children of God. We have been redeemed. He bought us. Listen, he purchased us by satisfying the awesome, righteous law of God that the soul that sinned it, that shall die. We don't have to die. We don't have to be lost because he paid our price. That's the first word, the word redemption. Then there's the word forgiveness. So I want you to turn, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 1 and several others, and I want us to look at all the verses that um, we have up here. Look, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 1. And you will, uh, Paul uh, all through all through the scriptures has is talking about forgiveness and our relationship to the Lord and and uh, in this first chapter uh, he says beginning in, the, in verse 7 listen to what he says he says in him that is in Christ we have redemption that's the way we got it through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses or our sins or transgressions according to the riches of His grace which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. That is, when you and I, for example, come to Him and ask Him to, uh, to forgive us of our sin, on what basis? You see, most people have the idea, well, the basis of my forgiveness is I ask Him. No, 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 no. That's not the basis of your forgiveness. Because remember, if when we sin against God, we sin against God, that sin has to be dealt with. And so, when you were saved, you asked God to forgive you. He forgave you on the basis that His Son went to the cross and shed His blood, which was His life, and He did that in your behalf and my behalf, so that when a person is saved, as we would say, what happens? They have asked Christ into their life. They've acknowledged His death as payment for their sin. And if you do not understand that part, then you have to say, well, I just asked him to save me. He saved me. On what basis? Well, because I'm going to be better. No, no, no. You're not, you're not, mm -mm, that's not it. What you're going to notice in all these words, in this whole description of the blood of Jesus, there's nothing in here about works. There's not a single thing in here about what we do. It's all about what he has done for us. So that the day that you knelt or the day that you walked some church out or whenever you got saved, when you asked him to forgive you, his forgiveness did not come because you, you prayed long, loud, felt the bolt of lightning or whatever you might. You said, well, you know, I got saved. Here's what something just hit me, knocked me down. Well, I don't know what was going on at that point. You don't have to get knocked down for the simple reason. The reason he saved you, watch this, one reason alone. Because you ask him to apply the death of Jesus Christ to your heart, which you have accepted the Son of God and his death that he paid your sin debt in full because you could not pay it. Now, think about people who don't believe any of that. Think about a person who says, well, will, I'm right with God on what basis? Well, because I pray. Well, who do you pray to? Well, I pray to God. Well, um, how do you do that? It doesn't take very many questions till they, they run out of answers fast, and I'm going to show you why in a moment. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We're forgiven of our sin. That is, that's how He forgave you. 
And you see, somebody says, and I've heard this oftentimes in the ministry, a person says, but if you know what I, if, if you just knew what I've done in my life, you would agree with me that God could not forgive me. So, well, what, what basis do you think he wouldn't forgive you? Because look what I've done. I said, well, let me tell you something about that. You can put all of your sin and all of my sin and all the sin of the whole world in one big package, and Jesus will still say, yes. Why will he say yes? Because he paid your price in full when he went to the cross and died. Listen, he became your substitute. God the Father sent him to die and to suffer the pain that he suffered and died and bled in order that he could forgive you. Therefore, it doesn't make sense where you've been, what you've done, how long, how old, how young. Your forgiveness does not come through you and for what you're going to do, but only because he shed his blood and you accepted that as true in your life. Well, there's another word, and that's uh, the word justification. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, let's think about it for a moment because uh, I, I know it's a long word, and yet um, um, it's a fantastic word. Let's think about that. There's, there's several verses, but turn to Romans chapter 5, and we look at two or three verses there. Uh, what does just, what's justification all about? Well, remember this, that God is a holy God, and God must punish sin. Somebody says, well, now, isn't God a God of love? Yes. You say, well, how, if He loves me, why would He punish me? Because He's going to be true to Himself, and if He weren't true to Himself and true to His own laws, and if He let you get by with sin, that wouldn't make you a saint at all. you just get worse and worse. Justification simply means this. Watch this carefully. That God because of the death of His Son and the shedding of His blood, that final sacrifice, God accepts that as full payment for your sin. Therefore, now God can do something awesome. When He said, the soul that sinneth it shall die and the wages of sin is death, how can God forgive us, cleanse us, make us whole. How can, how can he do all of that when he said the soul of the sin of it shall die and the wages of sin is death? That sounds like he's, a con he's contradicting his own law, and he would be except. Here's what he did. In order to remain just and holy, he sent Jesus to die on the cross, and because he is an adequate substitute, being the sinless Lamb of God, now when you and I ask him to forgive us and to cleanse us, and to save our soul, as we would say, He can do so because He chose to pay your debt. And not only that, He says in the process, He makes us righteous. So look at this fifth chapter of Romans for a moment. And um, I want you to notice a, a couple of verses here that are very important. And uh, start with verse 8 of Romans 5. But God demonstrates... His own love toward us. How's that? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen to that. Not after we not, not after we'd done good works. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So now look, watch this. Much more than having been justified by what? His blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we should be saved by His life. Now, watch this. Justified by His blood. Now, the fact that Jesus took our place made it possible for, for God to say, yes, I did say that soul that sinned that shall die, and my Son has taken your place at Calvary and shedding His blood. Therefore, I can forgive you of your sin declare you righteous, and still be the truthful God that I am. When you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, justification not only takes care of your sin debt, but the Bible says that God makes you a righteous person. You say, well, I don't act like it sometime. Well, that's, that's true. I understand that. But our position, listen, our position is that you and I are righteous in His eyes. Why? Because our sin debt's already been paid for. You say, well, does that mean now that I just go out and do anything I want to and everything will be okay? No, it does not. And if you're really saved, you're not going to want to do that. 
You may stoop to doing that at some point in your life, but you will pay. And what is that? That's God's discipline. And what is He doing? He's loving you. But this whole matter of justification, de listen, declared righteous. And let me say one stronger word. Declared no longer guilty. Declared not guilty, but you say, but I, ha I am guilty. I have been guilty. Right. And there is a penalty, and it's death. Right. Well, then if you don't pay, who pays? No one else can pay but the spotless, perfect Lamb of God. And that's why, here's what I want you to see. That's why God took such great pains, shall we say, great detail in being very, very specific and clear and meticulous about how those sacrifices were to take place. Spotless. The priest had to examine that lamb from one end to the other to be sure there was nothing there that would be in any way cause that lamb to be other than perfect because it was being sacrificed to holy God. If you brought a sick lamb, take it away. They wouldn't, they wouldn't offer it on the, on the altar. It was all a foreshadowing of what was to come, justified, declared righteous. That is, every single person who's received Jesus Christ as their person, genuinely saved by the grace of God, you, you, you have the righteousness of God. Because you'll notice what he said. He says the gift of righteousness. Not only do you have the gift of forgiveness, but you have the gift of righteousness. You're a righteous person. And if one thing should motivate us to want to live a godly life is the fact that He's given us the gift of righteousness. That is, that's who you are. Listen, a child of God, born of the Spirit of God, washed in the blood of God, listen, gifted with the righteousness of God, is there any wonder we should live a godly, holy, righteous life? We can do that through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. That's why He came. He says, I came to be your helper and to enable you. So, look at this. We've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We've been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. We've been justified by the blood of Jesus. And the Bible says we have been reconciled by His blood. So I want you to look at a couple of verses here. Let's look in Colossians chapter 1. Look at that for a moment. And um, when we think about reconciliation, probably the simplest way to describe that would be to think about uh, a husband and wife. Let's say that you all have a fight. I mean, you have a big fight, and you just can't stand each other, and you don't want to see each other anymore, and so you separate. And so you go her your way, she goes her way, and things are really bad. And then something happens that one of you says, you know, I wonder if we still have anything left between us. And uh, one person, whoever takes the initiative, you get to talk, and next thing you know, you just absolutely awesomely in love with each other. You'd call that about your marriage, you got what? You got reconciled. So it speaks of separation, and it speaks of coming together. Now, what I want you to see in the Scripture is this. God is always, without exception, the one who does the reconciling, and He's the one who takes the initiative. Now, here's the reason. Because, first of all, if you and I are living in sin, or if we, and if we've never been saved, we don't want to be saved. Listen, watch this. We don't want to be saved. We, we don't want somebody to tell us what we can do, what we can't do. And so, uh, we, we have no part of that. You say, but, but all of a sudden, your mind gets changed right. But who opened your eyes to see the truth? Who convicted you of sin? Who began to draw you to himself? That's all the work of God. And so, when you think about reconciliation, look at this verse. Verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. That is, it was God's pleasure for all the fullness. In, there is Jesus Christ was the Father in the human flesh. It's all the fullness that if you've, He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Now watch this. And through Him, verse 20, to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated, separated, and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death, that is, at the cross, in order to present you before Him holy, watch this, blameless, and beyond reproach. 
That's like the husband and wife coming back together and saying, you are absolutely fantastic, the most wonderful woman I've ever seen, the most wonderful guy I've ever met. In other words, absolutely, here's what he says, without reproach, reconciled. Now, how did that happen? God always is the one who takes the initiative. We don't take the initiative. You say, well, I just decided I was going to get saved. No, you responded to something God did. Now, God knows how to do this, and I was just talking to uh, a couple whose daughter uh, is on our in touch staff, and they're from India. And so he was telling me how he got saved. I said, well, how did you get saved? Because he, he was a Hindu from head to foot. I mean, he was totally in it. He says one day God said to him, wrong religion, wrong religion, wrong religion. You got to think, what's that about? <laughs> he says, God just revealed to him that he was not heading in the right direction, he found somebody who would explain to him what Jesus was all about. He got saved. His family got saved. He's a pastor now, and his daughter works at In Touch. And he was telling me about some other people who were just into their religion, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God just revealed Himself to them, and they, and they were being saved. That's the awesome power of God taking the initiative. Can anybody be saved when the Spirit of God works in your heart? Yes. You say, well, I want to be saved. You can be saved if you want to be saved. If you resist God, will He put pressure on you? Yes, He will. Well, how much pressure? Try Him. <laughs> you may be surprised how much pressure you get. In fact, you're going to have to deal with this message because it is the truth. It is the truth of the living God that He loves you and He wants the best for you. Listen, He's willing to buy you back, redeem you, forgive you of everything you've ever done, declare you no longer guilty and righteous in the eyes of God, bring you back into relationship with Him, reconcile, as He says. Then, of course, there is this whole issue of sanctification. So there's just uh, one verse here I want us to look at primarily. And, um, look, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. And somebody says, well, what, what's sanctification? Is that something the, the Pentecostals believe in? Is that, is that what that's all about? Uh, well, uh, let me just say this, that um, all of us who believe the Word of God believe in sanctification. Now, I know that some people uh, have a difficult time with that, but I think that part of that difficult time is the fact uh, they don't know what it means. And so what I want us to see here, uh, exactly, what, exactly what he's saying and so the best way for me to describe the best way for me to describe sanctification is this, and that is when you, watch this now. When you were saved, it's like when you were saved, an event happened. It's like a period. It was a one-time act. Saved, redeemed, justified, reconciled. But when it comes to sanctification, it's like this. It's like a period. That becomes, a, that becomes a line because sanctification is this process by which God sets you apart the moment you were saved, sets you apart because, because what? He redeemed you, and He saved you, and he, he, he justified you and, and reconciled you. So now you're one of His children. So what does He do? He not only sets you apart at that moment, but the whole Christian life is that line. It, it, it just keeps moving, and you keep growing in your Christian life, and you keep being enlightened and understanding, and the sanctification process is a process. It's a, it's a period, but it's also that line all the way to the moment you die. The sanctifying process is going on. That's why the children of God, people of God, should be being discipled because it's in discipleship that we learn who He is and what He's up to in life. He's not, he's not going to leave you where you are in your spiritual walk. It's, it's always going to be there. So he says in verse 12, Therefore Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people through His own blood, suffered out the gate, that is, He died outside the city on the cross. Why? To sanctify us, to set us apart as His children. Then this whole, access, this whole idea of access to God, and, and this is a very important thing. And um, in Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to turn there for just a moment, our access. Verse 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which He inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, His flesh. Now, what's all that about? Here's what it's about. Remember in the Old, in the Old Testament, 
and the new up to a point. The Holy of Holies was a place where God resided, uh, and the tabernacle, the same thing, the temple. But the Holy of Holies is where the ark was and where the law of God was, and so that's where he visited them. That's the way God would say it to them. So uh, a holy place. Who could go to the Holy of Holies? Only the priest once a year, and he had to do certain things before he could get there, how he was dressed and blood and so forth. Anybody else walked in there, sudden death. Now, what was God saying? And, they, and there always had to be this, the sprinkling of blood before you could go in certain places. Here's what he's saying. You and I have access to God the Father only through the blood of His Son, Jesus. Why? Because God is holy. And the only way you and I can come to Him is covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. That is, having received Him as our Savior, the blood is applied to our life, and what happens? We have access to Him. That's what the sacrificial system is all about. The sacrificial system was the heart of their worship. And what was He teaching them? That He's holy, and you do not come to Him apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why if somebody sinned, you brought a lamb, and that lamb was offered as a sacrifice for your forgiveness. You and I are able to talk to the Father, and, and He listens to us and guides us and leads us and answers our prayers on the basis that we, listen, we are approaching Him and can do so with confidence by the blood of Jesus. Where is Jesus seated at the Father's right hand doing what? Ever living to make intercession for us. And so when we come to Him, what happens? When we come to Him, humanly speaking, and we are one of His children, Jesus would say, here's one of ours. The blood's been applied. We have access. God can answer our prayer. Think about this. If the blood of Jesus Christ is not a part of your life, what you're saying is, I am going to approach holy God on the basis of my self-goodness, and nothing could be further from acceptance. In fact, if you'll think about it, it's the most prideful thing you can think of. I am going to approach holy God because I think I'm good enough. Here's what God says. You can only approach me by the sacrificial blood of my Son, Jesus Christ. Our access to Him. So if you're witnessing to somebody, they say, well, look, I don't need, I don't need all that Bible stuff. Don't give me that. Well, just ask him a few simple questions. Well, tell me about your God. Well, I don't know a whole lot about him, but I pray to him. Well, uh, what do you say to him? Well, I tell him about my needs. What does he say? What do you mean, what does he say? You see, they don't understand that God speaks. He's still speaking. But I'll tell you one thing. He'll never tell you anything that contradicts this book. If you want to know whether somebody's praying right or not, and they tell you something's off the wall, then... Um, or out of the book, shall I say, it's not in the book, then it's a whole different story. But there's one last thing I want you to notice about all this. We said, you know, our, our redemption, our forgiveness, our justification, our sanctification, our reconciliation, our access to Him. What about that daily forgiveness? So I want you to turn to 1 John, back on over to 1 John, and I want you to look at a, at a, at a couple of verses here. Because this is one thing that all of us have to deal with. And um, that is, after we're saved, we're not perfect, and uh, we, we do things that are not acceptable to God, and we sin against Him at some points. And so, in First John uh, chapter 1, I want you to read, if you will, uh, up to, to about three or four verses. First of all, in verse, verse 7, chapter 1. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light... We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, watch this. Here's what I want you to see. When He says, we, we walk in the light as He is, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. Now, watch. There is a tense of the verb that's like a period, just like that. Then there's a tense of the verb that means something like this keeps going on and on and on. And so, when He says, the blood of Jesus Christ is continually cleansing us from sin. Things we do, for example, let's say that uh, you came up to me and you hurt my feelings, and I said, that scoundrel, I'm telling you right now, then I'd have to confess that to God. Well, how do I know God's going to forgive me? Because He says His blood is continually forgiving us of our sin. Now, 
That's the seventh verse. Look at the ninth verse, which most people know by heart. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or the word could uh, be just. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just. What does that mean? That means if we confess our sins and we're genuine about it, He's faithful. You can count on Him to forgive you. Watch this. Because you've been justified and declared no longer guilty but righteous under the blood of Jesus. So He can do so properly. Then if you will look at uh, chapter 2 and these first two verses, and there are two words here I want you to notice. He says in verse 1, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now, what is a propitiation? A propitiation does not mean to appease somebody. To, to a propitiation is a sacrifice. That is, he says, and he himself is the sacrifice for our sins. And watch this. And not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. So G we have Jesus, our sacrifice, that makes it possible to come to the Father. But go back to the first verse, and notice he says, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, what's an advocate? Well, let's say that you have to go to court, and you've got somebody who's your advocate, and you have a lawyer, and he stands between you and the judge, and he, uh, he works in your behalf. And here's what he's saying, that when you and I sin against God, we have Jesus Christ, who is our advocate, who does what? Who stands in our behalf. Father, he's one of ours. He's forgiven. He's under the blood. That is, when you and I come to him, He's made everything possible for us. And so, how do, how do we deal with sin every day? We genuinely ask Him out of a conviction in our heart, knowing that we've done something wrong. You say, but suppose I keep on doing the same thing wrong. Will He keep on forgiving me? If it's genuine, if you mean it, and probably all of us, have confessed some things over and over and over again and promised Him, well, I promise you, God, if, you, if you'll just forgive me this time, I promise you I won't do it again. And how many times, you know what? He doesn't pay attention to that. He knows you're going to. And listen, that's what, listen, that's what grace is all about. Grace is all about God's awesome forgiveness. Now, if I'm just playing around and, and not meaning what I say, then you can look for the hand of discipline to come down. But he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because his righteousness is what he wants to shine forth in our life. So think about whether you think about the blood of Jesus Christ being precious or not. He says, it's by his blood he releases you from the power of sin in your life, redeems you. That he has made it possible for you to be forgiven once and for all, for all the things in your life that you've done. That He declares you no longer guilty and righteous in His eyes. That He brings you, He reconciles you back to Himself, makes it possible for you to be one with Him. That He sanctifies you, that He not only sets you apart, but He keeps on working in your life to the moment He calls you home. And that He's given, he, He's made it possible for you to have access to Him at any moment, at any time. That's what Hebrews 4 is all about. He says, we, have, we can with confidence come boldly to the throne of God and receive mercy and help in time of need. And not only do we have access, but we have this cleansing power that goes on all the time in our life. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you name anything else in all of life that has the power to do all of that? No, you do not. And so I would say to you, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've just heard the truth. And you've heard the simple truth of why God forgives us of our sin and how to be forgiven of our sin and how to keep clean and how to walk holy before Him. But you've also heard that if you ignore this and you refuse Him and you rebel against Him, and you close the Word of God into your life, and you don't want any of that, then remember this. You have chosen to live under the promise 
of the wrath of God. Is that because he doesn't love you? No. He loves you, but he will not violate his own truth. He's made it possible to forgive us and to cleanse us and to do all these things, even though we've sinned against him. He's made it possible through the blood of his son. But eliminate the blood, and your life is just one big corpse. You don't have anything. You're going to die. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment, he says in Hebrews 9. If you don't have Jesus, if his blood is not applied to your life, then what do you have? Nothing. You say, well, I'm a wealthy person. How long is that going to last? Can that get you to heaven? If you gave a million dollars a day for a thousand years, that wouldn't get you to heaven. Not one inch toward heaven. The blood of Jesus is the only way. And I trust you'll be wise enough to ask him to forgive you of your sins today and surrender your life to him and begin, listen, by the power of the Holy Spirit who will come within your life to enable you to live a godly life because that's what it's all about. And Father, how grateful we are for your awesome love for us. Thank you for telling us enough that we know how to walk, what to believe. Thank you for telling us enough that we have confidence and boldness and assurance that when we come to you, we come by the way of the blood and knowing that we'll be heard and that we'll be answered. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. More from Dr. Stanley still ahead on In Touch. We invite you to visit InTouch.org where you'll find lots of resources to help strengthen your relationship with Christ. For example, if you just accepted Jesus as your Savior, we want to send you a free New Believers Kit to help you get started. Order today's message, The Precious Blood of Jesus. Get Life Principles Notes. It's a free download of highlights from the sermon. And encourage our troops with the Word of God through the In Touch Messenger. Find all this and other resources at InTouch.org. Obey God and leave all the consequences to Him. Fight all your battles on your knees and you'll win every time. Dr. Charles Stanley's Life Principles Bible, now available in the New American Standard Version. Gain valuable insight into the principles that have shaped more than 50 years in ministry. Answers to life's questions, life examples, and life lessons. Order your New American Standard Life Principles Bible today. Call our toll-free number or go to InTouch.org. Are you guys still trying to find friends on that site? No, we're checking out a new one. It's called Grounded. Here, take a look. A community-based website for young adults with real choices to make. Stay connected with friends and meet others with your interests. Interactive feedback on life issues. Bible studies, videos, and articles seen in the spotlight for Grounded members only. Join today. InTouch.org slash Grounded. We heard from many of you after a recent program dealing with personal conflict. You send emails and letters about deep-seated family problems, sin, and abuse. Those responses represented more than likely not just thousands, but probably millions of people who are in extreme emotional pain. And whether adversity comes from bad choices we've made or from someone who's sinned against us, there's hope and healing in Jesus Christ. Well, for example, this email. This lady writes, I had an abortion at a young age, can God forgive me? Well, the answer is yes, He can. He's willing to forgive any sin we confess and repent of. But there are consequences, and probably the reason you think He's not forgiving you is because you're confusing the consequences with His forgiveness. He forgives, but He does not promise there'll be no consequences. He says we reap what we sow, more than we sow, and later than we sow. Does that mean that God's love stops? No. It means that in spite of the fact that God forgives us, there's some things, there's some sins that there will be consequence no matter what happens. But forgiveness, yes. And then a second reads, how can I forgive and forget what my wife did to me and my family? Well, how can you forgive? It's a choice we make. 
And think about this. Christ has forgiven you many, many times in your life. And you have never been to him that he said, no, that sin's too bad. I'm not going to forgive you. He always forgives. Now, you and I must forgive, but that doesn't mean we're going to forget it. Somebody says, well, you know, I've asked God to forgive me, but I can't forget it. Well, God doesn't promise that you're going to forget everything, but it's the forgiveness that you desire and that you need. And if you do not forgive, no matter what someone has done to you, here's what happens. You double your own pain. Because God has forgiven you, you think about the past, you become bitter, you hurt your own family, and what happens is you have enough pain for what happened to you. Don't grow bitter and resentful and hostile and angry at someone else when you can forgive. And here's what happens. Your forgiveness will free you of the hurt and the pain that someone else has brought to you. Well, then there's a third. And in this email, in a very difficult situation, this lady explains, I feel like God has turned his back on me and does not love me anymore. And I need to know why. (laughs) Well, let me just say this. First of all, that's a feeling you have, but it's not true. Here's what he says in Hebrews 13, 5. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, more than likely what's going on in your life is this. You have unresolved guilt about something. And as a result, you don't, you can't forgive yourself and you don't feel like you deserve to be forgiven and you certainly don't deserve his love. And the devil's lying to you saying, well, how could God forgive you for what you've done? So what you must remember is this. Either you will believe what God says or you'll believe your feelings. And to believe your feelings is never the right attitude. What does the Word of God say? Does He say that I'm going to love you for a season and then stop loving you? No. All of us probably at some point in our life may have had the same question. God, do you love me? And if you do, why do you let these things happen? Well, if you add all of these emails together, here's what you get. It all equals adversity. Adversity comes in many forms, difficulty, hardship, and pain. But the question is, what do we do with them? We either let them destroy us with bitterness, or we allow them to be a bridge to a deeper relationship with God. And in our Life Principle Bible, in the 26th principle in that Bible, there's a whole description and a whole explanation about adversity and how God uses that in our life for our own good. And when I think about these questions, I think about in Hebrews chapter 10 and the 35th and 36th verse says, Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. God is not going to forget you. He loves you no matter what. And all the adversity that comes into your life and my life and the lives, lives of millions of people, we either respond one of two ways. We grow bitter Oh, we can make it a bridge. Now, somebody says, well, why doesn't God get me out of this quickly? (laughs) You know, we've all asked that question. There's nothing in the Bible about a quick exit from sin and adversity. It's a matter of hanging and then trusting God. So what's the key? Obey Him, whatever He's telling you to do. Surrender your life to Him. God knows your future. And one thing for certain, if you'll respond right, He will bring good out of every single one of these circumstances, no matter what they are. The key is keep your focus on Him, not on the circumstance. Well, thanks for joining us today on In Touch. And please keep those emails coming. We love to answer the questions. And until next time, if you want life at its very best, obey God, leave all the consequences to Him, and remember what you hear and apply it to your life. Touching the world with a passion for God and compassion for people. In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley is a presentation of In Touch Ministries. This program is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.